So firstly, I'd like to say hello to our online audience. Thank you very much for joining us. And today we're going to be discussing central bank digital currencies. We've got a great group of people for today's discussion, and we're really going to consider why CBDCs is such a popular term at this current moment in time. So I'm going to invite them all to join me on screen, um, and I'm going to start off by asking each of them to give us a short introduction of who they are and the companies they're representing today. Um, perhaps we could start with yourself, Anthony. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, uh, name is Anthony Oduwale. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders at Red Zero FX. Uh, we are basically a B2B payment or cross-border payment platform in the UK, uh, FCA regulated with EMR license. Uh, we basically are building solutions for businesses across the globe, focusing on the emerging markets and trying to get them an easier way to accept payments internationally and then obviously make local payments as well. So rather than having to do everything through the typical SWIFT payment that businesses go through today, we want to almost localize payments. So we call it global local. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you should be able to accept money as a local in the foreign currencies and obviously pay out as well as a local. Um, so we are currently in about three countries, UK obviously being the uh, main location, uh, but we are in Kenya, South Africa, and obviously expanding to the rest of Africa this year, and hopefully to Asia in the following year. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, and then secondly, maybe come to Willie, give us a quick uh, introduction. Thank you, Mark. Hello, it's good to be here today. My name is Willie Lim. I am from R3. I am uh, I am representing R3. I am I am from our Solution Architect Global Advisory uh, Team. I look after digital currencies, uh, capital markets, and payments. R3, for everyone who knows, doesn't know that R3 is a world leading provider for enterprise technology and services that enable direct uh, digital collaboration in regulated industries such as like capital markets, financial systems, and trade. Uh, we are effectively a global company where we have two main product lines. One is that our leading product, Corda DLT, which is specially used among by financial institutions all around the world to deliver various solutions, such as from the like of central bank digital currency all the way to trade financing. And also at the same time, a second product, which is called Conclave, which is specifically around confidential computing, which is really around uh, allowing third party at the station or calculation without really, ex uh, without really you know, like uh, sharing sharing sensitive data per se. Yeah. I'm really very excited to be here today in this panel. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Happy to have you. Um, and then uh, Peter, perhaps uh, a quick introduction for yourself, please. Yes, Peter Wister Christensen. I'm working for LPA, which is a European centric but uh, global reach uh, consulting company where we basically are advising primarily banks uh, across the globe in basically the whole value chain from uh, product distribution basically down to, to custody and, and, and settlement services. Uh, in that sense, I'm very much focused on, on actually the use cases or the business cases associated with it, both for traditional banks, but also, also for more sort of the fintech startup scene. And I, uh, I'm very happy to, to be here today and to be able to give a little bit of an insight and experience into the, that area. Thank you very much, Peter. And last but not least, David, if you could just give us a quick introduction. Sure, thanks, Mark. Uh, no, great to join the discussion today. I'm CEO for Liam Liang Global, which is a global fintech operate across UK, Europe, US, all of Southeast Asia, South America, and of course, China. We are China born, but very much a global company now. So we're business focused, global business payments network, uh, we work with the major banks, particularly City, Deutsche Bank, Tier 1 banks, and really provide a sort of application solution layer on top that helps businesses grow globally. And our core is payments, and we uh, provide end-to-end -end business payments network with licenses around the world, but also we integrate other services into our platform so that we solve not just the payments issues, the operational issues, and the go-to-market issues for our customers. Fantastic. Right. So... Um... As we sort of uh, alluded to in, in the introduction, you know, by, by its name, a central bank digital currency, CBDC, as we're hearing a lot of, is a virtual format of an existing fiat currency. So why is this term now completely exploded? And why are we talking about this all the time now? I was, I was gonna come round to, to each of us and, and just give a little bit of an understanding of what, what, what does it actually mean to you 
um, as a CBDC and, and how it relates to some other things that are in the, the, sort of the digital currency space as well. Uh, and maybe start with yourself, Willie. Thanks, Mark. That's a very great question. I think this is CBDC, so one of those enigma, like a lot of, I think there's a lot of misconception out there, a lot of complication, but in fact, let's keep it very simple. CBDC is a digital, it's a digital currency that is backed by a legal tender issued traditionally by a trusted institution. What makes this one really quite different compared to the other digital currency or cryptocurrency that's been out there? This is for the very first time we have a payment instrument that is tied up to a trusted legal tender. What does it mean? It's like similarly to how we settle payments using a physical cash nowadays, we facilitate instant settlement this time in a digital economy. Now, on the other hand, uh, CBDC is, although it's quite simple, it's just digitizing a physical, uh, physical note what what challenges it's brought in is when you apply it in a in our tradition in our current uh, digital ecosystem which is mostly designed based on the credit market so this is where the various complications start to kick in yeah Interesting. over back to okay. you Mark. yeah and then maybe coming to david a little bit as well so so from your perspective how does it compare to things like stable coins for example which obviously are also pegged to a, a fiat currency surely yeah, no, they are. And I think there's really three classes here. There are the true cryptos, the Bitcoins of the world, which I classify as kind of its new technology plus uh, ideology uh, in terms of focus on anonymity outside regulatory control. you got CBDCs at the other end, which are all about the same new technology plus sovereignty and all of the issues that central banks care about in terms of financial stability and the sovereignty of the, their money, their currency. And in the middle of stable coins, which are within the regulatory framework, and they look to work within the central bank and regulatory frameworks around the world, but they are using the new technology and doing it in a private company basis rather than through the central bank. And I think the interesting issue is obviously, you know, timeline. Uh, cryptos have exploded, uh, certainly from an in alternative investment point of view, if not payments point of view. Uh, central bank digital currencies are likely to take time. And you know, China began its institutes uh, for the digital RMB 2014. Stable coins are poten potentially an interesting transition step as we adopt this new technology into payments and particularly cross-border payments. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. And Peter, maybe coming to you sort of slightly, what, what's your sort of take on the, the sort of the, the spread of different sort of digital currencies and how they relate to a central bank digital currency? Um, if we look at sort of central bank digital currencies and, and basically what do we have there, as David said, yes, I totally agree his analysis, we have these three uh, steps there, but if we're really looking into the uh, CBDC as such, there are a lot of sort of sort of in the system things that you have to look at anonymity. Uh, do I, uh, I live in Germany. Uh, it's very important, uh, privacy laws and, and privacy is important. I don't want anyone and especially not the state to know where I'm spending money on the one side. Then on the other side, uh, you will actually need and, and you could actually envisage a CBDC if you can solve all of these problems, actually even to go as far as taking the place of deposit money in commercial banks. So uh, you're seeing that kind of discussion going on in the US. Uh, you can say it's partially under the surface also in the EU. Uh, if you look at Sweden, uh, they are not, they're really just basically aiming at replacing the coins. So, so they're not talking about that kind of volume. So really, if we look at CBDCs, we have to basically take each country uh, by side and basically see where they are and also what are their strategic options uh, on looking at that. And I think that's also a thing to look at. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. Just <clears throat> to close down on this point, Anthony, coming to you. So if I was to phrase the, the definition that we've just kind of heard and say, we've got state regulated coins, we've got company regulated coins, and we've got completely unregulated coins. How would you react to that sort of statement and, and your definition of what where CBDCs fit in? Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Mark. That's that's a very interesting question. Um, I find it very fascinating, fascinating in the sense that obviously Bitcoin started this wave of digital currencies. Then we moved to stablecoin, where obviously Facebook came in. They tried to have one centralized private stablecoin. Then CBDC obviously came out of that. 
And I actually think from my point of view, when you look at the common fiat solution and now it's going to be in use, CBDC is actually the equivalent of that. And whether the government wants or not, they need to do that if they want to continue what they're doing today. But what CBDC actually does that I think almost transcend the current fiat is it provides more solution for people and businesses that the current fiat doesn't give you. So for example, if you're a, a, a government in developing market, you can actually control your taxation, like welfare policies, because that money is digital. Before when it's cash, you don't know who's taking money off the table, all those things. So from government point of view, it's a good solution. But how does that affect business transaction? How does that affect um, the day-to-day -day running of a business? I think that's the part that they are currently struggling. I don't think there's a clear view of what they want to do or what they need to do. Uh, the same thing that Peter said in terms of like, different country have different solutions. And if you want to have a centralized digital currency, it cannot be like, you know, this country has their own process, that country has their own process, because today I can swap pounds to dollar, it's that straightforward. So there has to be that kind of like a synergy between these countries in terms of how they're going to operate together. And then that will provide massive value to end clients, especially in developing countries where access to money is not easy, remittances and all those things. So I think when it, to go back to your question, I think CBDC is a good solution. The problem is implementation of it or the regulation that will go around it. That for me is going to be the problem and that's not clear right now. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, as you said. It, and, and I think, you know, let, let's focus back in on to, to what the subject matter is, which is CBDCs. And, and obviously, and I think, as you said, implementation, that's kind of the key. Um, I kind of alluded to everyone before we sort of started here that, you know, I think at Singapore Fintech Festival back in 2019, I was talking to the Central Bank of Cambodia that we're going to be the first person to release it. I was like, it's a great idea. Um, what are you going to do with it? You know, it's going to be great for the internal country, but does it mean you can now trade it with someone else and you can move it around? And and I think that in essence is is kind of what we're coming back to. Um, maybe popping over to yourself, David, and just sort yeah. of talking because I think you alluded in your statement as well about you know the the digital yen was was you know found thought about even before that. What's your take on on how you know different countries are taking it? And maybe if you want to talk a little about China or something like that, perhaps. Yeah. Uh no, I mean, I think the key thing is to start with, you know, why does the central bank want to move to a digital currency? What are the benefits? And different countries will have different views. Uh, you know, as Anthony mentioned, for emerging uh, markets, you will see huge value in financial inclusion. You don't need a traditional bank account. You kind of sidestep all of that and you can go direct to the individual in a very effective and efficient way. So, you know, there's clearly a lot of benefits uh, around financial inclusion, around efficiency of payments. There's also benefits in terms of it's programmable money. That's one of the key things. So in terms of, you know, we've spoken a lot about, uh, you know, stimulus during the pandemic. If the government could actually be targeted in terms of how it dispersed its stimulus, where it was usable for certain things, usable within a certain time, it's always a challenge. How do you get money to small to medium businesses? There's huge power in a central bank digital currency when you can link the government policy to that programmable money capability. So other countries will take that view. There's also huge value in terms of the data and the insights that come from actually having transparency about all the transactions, but that also raises the risk about privacy and data security, which, which I think is a key concern, particularly for say European countries uh, who have a strong tradition around uh, personal privacy. So I think each country is gonna take a different view of really what's the motivation one thing that's going to be common, and it's back to the theme of the implementation, is when individuals now have a direct account with the central bank, which is fundamentally what, fundamentally, that's what a CBDC is. It means I, as an individual, have an account with the central bank. What is the role of the commercial banks? And uh, certainly in China, there's a two-tier model where you know they don't want to disrupt the banks. They want to preserve the banks as the core infrastructure for managing the financial system. And I think most central banks will take a similar view of a two-tier model, but there's a lot of details to work out within that. And particularly, we've touched on this, is this M0, is this M1, is this you know, zero interest, is it just replacing cash, or is this actually really going to get into the heart of the business model of commercial banks? China started out with an M0 model, uh, and I think China also, frankly, has some other uh, objectives with this. China's obviously led the world in digital payments, Alipay, WeChat Pay, but those are two private companies that have developed very much a monopoly or duopoly. 
you know, the central bank digital RMB actually potentially breaks that open because this is legal tender. That's the key thing. So mm. anyone who has it can go to a merchant and they have to accept it. So it sort of breaks the power of a major incumbents in terms of controlling that point of sale, the merchant point of sale. So I think each country's got to figure out, is going to figure out its objectives. Uh, but I think one of the fundamental themes that's going to run through it is the relationship between central bank and commercial banks, and also this issue of privacy versus transparency of the data, control of the data and programmability. Yeah, I think it's really an interesting point. And maybe come to Willie uh, for a little bit of your comments, specifically maybe around sort of um, China and the model. How, how does um, what David was saying resonate with you? Do you think that's kind of one of the the, the dreams or the core of the uh, the banks to, to sort of enable them to hold on to things? That's like actually to add it on to what David has suggested. This actually that's really a true phenomenon at the moment. So this is where we see a lot of like debates going out there, although like in large institutions, such as like the Bank for International Settlement has already set out like various models, distributed models. Some are direct issuance directly to the to the end consumers, some with a hybrid model, which is an, which is an improvement of our current intermediation models. Now, definitely going back to from a China's perspective, definitely China's uh, business case, uh, which is use case around like leveling the competitive advantage, especially with close to payment systems, resonates definitely in some of the emerging countries, especially like a, a lot of the gaps in the, in, the, in the traditional, like in emerging markets, traditionally use electronic private monies as a way of closing the gap that where the banks are unable to facilitate a faster payment, for example. And this is where they could learn coming out from the experience of a DCEP with PBOC that could also pl apply to that one. However, it's it's not as, as what Anthony suggested, and has uh, it also depends on the jurisdictional. Like there's some jurisdictional, like faster payment should be good enough, but the motivation from the government is slightly different. It's more around like making sure that monetary policy is still there, uh, with, with especially with a lot of the payment private systems that are all all managed by the private sector. So they need to find they need to address that balance per se. Uh, so lastly, as well, programmable money is also a very interesting topic nowadays. Like, although China has started to say that they this is something that they want to explore further down the track, programmable money is to me twofold. One, it could be like it could be able to promote sort of like a fraud a fraud detection mechanism, overlaying things around like compliance, all of those. At the same time, as well, this is where we'll probably a little bit more controversial where where it can CBDC with programmable money accompanied by a distributed ledger technology, you can actually wrap it, wrap it around to become like an investable product where at the same time, you can use it as a drawdown for a payment while at the same time, you can actually earn interest per se. So these are some of, I would say like innovations where I think several of the central banks and the together with the private sector are clo closely collaborating. But definitely we can now see two sides of the camps. We have one financial institution, so are probably against, it will pr probably propose for like a staging uh, model, which we, like David suggested, like a stable coin. There are some have seen probably vision, uh, visualize the future where CBDC could be a game changer that will be changing the whole business landscape. And they're trying to evolve based on what the CBDC will actually deliver to the ecosystem. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, just thinking, Anthony, on, onto that same sort of thing, obviously, we've talked a lot about CBDCs being a real enabler for the unbanked populations and, and, and various other things like that. Did you see any particular countries that are really leading with that sort of concept of, of why they're developing the CB, uh, CDBC? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, what the, the few countries, uh, I think we mentioned Singapore already, and mm. I actually like the concept of Singapore day one. I don't know whether that's what they implement right now. And that was a multi-currency CBDC, which kind of means that you're not just focusing on your own local currency, you're making it possible for your local merchant to trade cross-border, right? And for me, that is super important if you're gonna do that because having a digital currency to replace another fiat is not doing anything. It's just one-to-one -one, one -one mapping. But if you can allow them to easily transact with neighboring countries where there might be illiquidity in the currency, accessibility. So all the fees that comes in with payment and all those troubles of settlement delays and so on, you almost automatically reduce that to an extent to mitigate against that. So I, also, I think for me, uh, countries like that, if they actually implement it correctly, that is a good 
solution. Uh, if you look at, uh, let's say, um, the Nigerian government, which they, I think they launched the CBDC about a week ago, they're trying to do the same thing, but they're trying to almost do the monitoring aspects of it. They want to control remittances coming to the country. Uh, they want to make sure that they get the right taxation from all these like fintech, global remitting companies that are actually moving money to the country because they want to make money off it so they can use it for their own money of the, of, of the country, right? So they, they, for me, the objective is about what the country needs rather than how is it solving individual problems. But when you look at Nigeria as a country, is a developing country, like a lot of these solutions can be used for financial inclusion. I'm sure during the COVID period, compared to UK or US where people were getting digital money to an extent in the bank accounts to, to be able to survive, it wasn't that easy for some of those countries because you can't physically go to a bank and there's no digital way. So I would have expected this kind of solution, if God forbid we had another COVID, another pandemic, it would be a good solution because now they can easily credit someone's wallet and people that maybe have to go to a job to, to actually make a living can stay at home. And that is a good solution. So I'll say different countries have different concepts, uh, but going back to my original point, like, and if kind of bringing China into this, what I think China is doing today uh, from outside that you can always almost criticize it to say, uh, what are they trying to like restrict assets, stopping some of this company that are doing crypto to stop trading and all those things, right? But in effect, if you want this currency to actually take shape, there has to be time limit. It can be everlasting. Let's see how people adopt it. Because naturally, the way Bitcoin or digital currency started was to stay away from the government issued currency. So no one's going to adopt it by default. Right, so for me, that, that strategy where, in a way it's not great, but hopefully they'll open up again. That's what they were saying, okay, you must use it. I think there's a period where they trying to force McDonald's to take the payment using CBDC, but that has obviously increased the volume and the take up. I think the H1 this year, they probably have about 5 billion of USD worth that was on the bit. So if they didn't do that, that would never happen. But hopefully they do it in a short period to then open up back to, normal currency where people have the option to use it or not. I yeah. think for me that's, that's going to be the, 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 how we shape up depends on how they implement it because you can't force individuals to take on something that they don't like initially. And well, it's, it's, it's a really interesting, interesting I think. It's, it's, it's I don't think that's really the approach in China. It's not forcing people. Uh, yeah. It is providing incentives to people incentives. to trial it and they've got yeah. very good uptake in that in a number of the major cities. But something you touched on I think is really uh, critical for how CBDCs evolve, which is just rolling out a CBDC domestically is hugely complex. And even though it seems simple, you know, you see the consumer use case, digital payment, wow, this is great. When you look at, okay, how do you implement this with the right risk management, the right controls, with the banking system, yeah. domestically, that's a huge challenge. And, you know, the central banks sort of do no harm is always sort of the starting point. And then when you get to cross-border, that's a whole other level of complexity. And I, I think that's gonna prove very, very challenging. I think the uh, BIS I did a good paper on this, laying out the options. And uh, I think realistically, we're gonna see uh, countries, they are gonna accelerate their CBDCs, but the focus is gonna be domestically, and it is in China. So, you know, they've announced the collaboration with Thailand and UAE for cement trials around cross-border, but the focus is very clearly on domestic payments and it will be for some time. It's a, yeah. I think it's a really interesting thing, David. I was going to come to, to Peter to just give us a little bit of a view from across the other side of the pond as well. Um, but the, the kind of like the idea that I've had a lot of times is, are, are we just doing what all the banks did for many, many years and, and just tried to digitalize something that was already in, in, in existence? So they take a fiat currency and they just make it virtual. Uh, and I think a lot of people had a bit of skepticism when that was starting. But I was going to come to Peter and just sort of say, you know, how, how do you find that particular, but also maybe relate it a little bit to the US, which I don't think yeah. we've really talked about. Too <clears> yes, I, I, th I think, uh, as always, we have different layers. And let's basically start uh, with what I see the first layer. So let's say, what is China doing non-domestically? I totally agree with David that the domestic rollout of a currency uh, CBDC is, is a different game. And there, uh, personally, I would basically see that uh, banks will have that typical custodian role uh, in that of basically managing that because I don't see the central bank basically replacing uh, the retail banks. Um, so that's the first thing. So really taking it from the top, 
on a geopolitical game, we basically have the US dollar is the reserve currency of the world. Most large transactions happen in US dollars. And uh, to be frank, when a, a smaller fiat currency fails, being it Venezuela or Zimbabwe, uh, they are usually replaced by either US dollar or in some countries, uh, euros. So, so, so this is just sort of how the world works at the moment. So you can actually say there is one dimension in this talk here that is, especially from a US perspective, it's power projection. So they, can, uh, they, they need the ability to basically stay in that reserve currency play because otherwise they have no chance of basically funding their public deficit. So it's a, it's a very, very simple, uh, simple uh, piece of math uh, going on there. So does that, does that sorry to interrupt you, yeah. but does that give them a, a much bigger challenge than anyone else though? Because that, do they need to also <laughs> yes. not only think about their domestic use of the coin, yeah. they need to think about the international one exactly. at the same time. Exactly. And as David said, that is just a whole nother ball game, isn't yeah. it? You know, uh, and that was you could say that was actually why uh, you, we are seeing uh, we are seeing a lot of different uh, discussions going on in the US at the moment where they should be uh, be going. You have basically the the globalists talking about uh, what do we need to, to do on a global scale. We have uh, uh, Amorova, who is, the, uh, uh, who is Biden's nominee for the OCC, who is talking about Fed accounts. Uh, we have uh, a lot of different sort of talks and, and streams going on in the US at the moment of where would the dollar eventually go from a, CD, a CBDC point of view. And I think uh, that is sort of, on, on the global scale, uh, the first thing that, that, that need to be cracked and, and, and understood. Secondly, we have the Chinese. Uh, of course, they are, uh, uh, they are afraid of sanctions. Uh, very, very simply, uh, you don't want to be shut out of the SWIFT network. Uh, uh, then you have as a bank, and let's say as large corporates, you have a serious problem of actually doing cross-border payments if that happens. So you could say the whole sanction system that is there and the uh, possibilities there also very much linked to payments and especially cross-border payments. I agree. Really I think that's an interesting uh, point. I mean, I think there's a lot of discussion, yep. uh, speculation around is the DCP, digital RMB, going to make the RMB replace the dollar as a reserve currency? And they, but you shouldn't conflate two issues. Uh, digital currencies do provide a way to avoid SWIFT, do provide a way to get around sanctions. That's not going to fundamentally change, nope. you know, which is the reserve currency. Nope. Two very, very different issues. So, yeah. And going back to sort of what Anthony mentioned earlier about Singapore, where they, they were talking about a multi currency central bank digital currency, which are they trying to just be, play, play nice to both parts of the world? And that's kind of where it kind of feels to me is like they, they don't want to hedge their bets one way or another. Are they saying we just want to be, as, as Singapore is very good at doing, we want to be everything to everybody? Yeah. Uh, so I was going to say, Anthony, yeah. No, I was, I was going to say, it's, it's quite interesting in the sense that I don't know the position, but if I was thinking as a, as a fintech company and what they're doing, for me, they want to be potentially that coin, that central digital currency that everyone else pair with in case there's no interoperability between CBDCs today, right? So if they have multi currency, let's say 50 currencies, they can easily say, hey, one of our currency equals to this amount of your currency. So any digital currency can easily swap. And before you know, if, they, if that take up, they become that central point of view of the new digital currency until when you have a direct map in between different currency, which will take a while. So I can imagine that's probably how they're going about, not necessarily, I mean, I don't think they think about how it's going to be implemented, but if they get the adoption, get people to buy into that, that's actually a big, big win for them because yeah. suddenly put them in that central position it's a very interesting point. And I think without going down into too many political routes, yeah. Singapore is, is very much run like a business. Um, and so they're probably the only country in the world that could potentially pull something like that off if they really put their mind to it. Yeah. Um, however, saying they're going to do it and being able to actually do it are obviously very two very, very large things as well. Um, and I, I was going to say, Peter, do you want to yeah. comment on that? Yeah, but um, that's exactly the thing that is, if you look at the, uh, uh, if, if you were to compare 
the uh, the Singapore model to anything that we know already is basically a clearinghouse. Yeah. So it's 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 exactly the same thing. I have my clearinghouse. I do my payments. I get my pieces or whatever, uh, and uh, so so that's nothing but sort of the the model of the clearinghouse mm -hmm. uh, that they're uh, basically running there. So mm -hmm. it, it makes perfectly sense. You need a place like Singapore or Switzerland or something like that uh, to, to be able to fulfill that role. It's uh, really interesting. And, I was going to sort of ask Willie to sort yeah. of come in on that as well, is that, you know, that comes back to my other comment um, earlier on about, are we just trying to replace an old system with a slightly newer tweaked system that's a bit more digital? Because now we're talking about, you know, central clearing systems. Don't we already have that with fiat currencies? You know, the, what, what, what's your take on whether are, are, are the are the governments truly looking to adopt a, a digital currency or are they or are they just trying to fool us all that they're doing a bit of digital transformation in the background? That's actually a very good point. In fact, if you look into like there's even one uh, ongoing project with the MAS which is really to link with the faster payment of India with NPCI. You can start to see that the faster payments are interconnecting with each other. In fact, even between Cambodia and Singapore, Singapore and Thailand, to add on to what Anthony suggested, it's definitely, if you look into the business, the, how Singapore is operating, it is a financial hub. And they're just trying to make sure that they still remain as a financial hub and is driven by CBDC. Now, the very first thing about CBDC is really, if we still be able to integrate all of this, uh, all of the in, all of our systems, it's a faster payment, all of those, but what, what, we're, what we're still facing is like we're inheriting some of the fundamental barriers that we're facing nowadays. So take it to example, like if you just automate everything, just a massive clearing house, you still have, you still have a lag time between clearing and settlement. As we all know, like, you know, there's like, we can see faster payment nowadays, we get credited right away. But behind the, behind the background, the reality is banks still take several hours or several potentially a day just to settle whatever the, 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 that payment initiation has begun. So with CBDC, this is again, one of the hypotheses of CBDC as it promotes instant settlement because it is based on a legal tender. If having that one interoperating with variety of countries, you can almost see like you have, you're facilitating, facilitating instant settlement. So take it to example, like remittance coming out from the Philippines, which is really solely like, or the the uh, the source of the economy is really remittance, and all of the of the expats coming out, for example, like the like of Singapore or expats uh, in the Middle East. Now you started to see like all remittance are being moved across, really using through what is like a physical notes. It was really like in a digital form. So effectively, you have now like you're balancing out the potential like problems around like uh, uh, an ecosystem operated by a close to payment system, such as like, for example, the Alipay and the WePay. At the same time, the state is also trying to mitigate any competitive advantage uh, by, by making like a more competitive landscape for everyone. Yeah, definitely. It's still, I agree, it's still a long way to go. It's still, there's still fundamental things that needs to be addressed. But I think with CBDC, there's as the state, as most of the government is saying, probably like it's there's a fighting chance that we can actually address some of these fundamental problems. Yeah, is Mark, it, probably, it wouldn't thought, be a sorry. Go David. Well, yeah. I just had a thought on that. Is this just a bit of digital uh, whitewashing, or is it really substantive? Uh, I think you know the key thing. You know the cheerleaders, CD, CBDCs talk about, hey, this is real time global settlements, and you know when you compare it to the corresponding banking network, that's true. You know, we all know the limitations of that model. Yeah. You know, if you take our model, we already provide, you know, we do e-money, everything's digital, real-time global settlements across all the countries we operate. So it's that's not really kind of the, the thing. I think that what this comes down to is not the initial phase, it's the capabilities embedded in CBDC, which is government access to all the data, government control of money because of the programmable capabilities of CBDCs. Those are the things that are the game changers, kind of those sort of operational efficiencies, improvements compared to the corresponding banking network. It's kind of a bit of a short term distraction, really, in terms of what's what's the heart of the issue. Yeah, it's I, really interesting I guess point. I yeah. guess to add on to that one as well, like with the with the fundamental problem with the corresponding bank network, because it's all side up with the bank's balance sheet, right? It's good if all the banks have a solid balance sheet, but what if like, for example, like emergent countries 
where banks have a very weak balance sheet, and obviously that will have a contagion risk as well. But I agree with David, the game changer is really the programmable money. This is where really where I think what we see this, the strongest benefit. So I think as we kind of predicted, we, we are going to run out of time very quickly and, and we could talk for a lot longer. But one, one point that you sort of just alluded to there is, um, you know, the, the downside or the concerns. So, so maybe let's just spend a little, a little bit of our last bit of time just talking about some of the concerns there. So, you know, one of the concerns that, that I would sort of say is that, uh, is it whitewashing? And, you know, we, we've kind of covered that quite well. But the second one that you mentioned, David, is, is this a play for governments to know more about what's going on and control things more? And I don't know, Anthony, if you want to jump in on that. And what, what's your take on, on the risks of these uh, central bank digital currencies? Uh, well, that's, that's a very good question. The, the risk is, is, is mongoose when you think about it. So outside what David said, in terms of having control and so on, there's a lot of risks that they haven't thought of. And one of those for me is going back to liquidity of the currencies, right? So just because it's now digital doesn't mean suddenly everything is one-to-one. -one. So if you are a, a country in, let's say Kenya or you're in Uganda or you're in South, South America or somewhere, your currencies still have to be uh, paid against dollar or whoever that takes shape, right? In that particular moment, does it, having access to CBD means that, CBDC means that you can easily cross uh, paid easily, as in terms of like getting accessibility, which right now is one of the problem. If you live in long term, you can't just get access to dollar that easily through your bank or through any digital currencies that is available. So does that improve that? And for me, I don't see how that's going to be the case because if you're a US, uh, US dollar and if you're the, the uh, what's called the Fed, you don't want to have other current foreign currencies on your balance sheets that are not stable or which again could be the same problem when you go to the digital side. If not, that would be great. So for me, one of the main risks, it's not just on that. So I think the main risk that they need to address is interoperability of their currency itself, right? And that goes from like FX side, the foreign exchange that we have today. How do you do that in the future? Because if you want it to be cross-border, you want it to be international, it can't just be domestic. It has to go outside the country. Um, the other side that they need to ensure is in place efficiency. So if they coming from the point of view of, uh, we just want to monitor what's going on in the country, that's not why we need that. That's not what consumer wants or in the or businesses. So it needs to be efficient when it comes to instant sentiment that David alluded to. Like if you already have faster payments everywhere and you can set to locally everywhere right now, what is the point of having CBDC? Because it's not changing anything. It's just a whitewash. It's just doing the same thing in a different way. Um, and I would say maybe lastly is like, the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of it. That could be super interesting because if everyone is plugged into one digital currency, even within the country, can I easily just swap money with you and all those things? And how do you then bring things like fraud, transaction monitoring, like terrorism financing and all those things? Because now it's, it's just a wallet wallet, it's all digital. I don't need to go to my bank and say, I'm paying to David and David get a check on his uh, data to see whether it should be getting paid for me and so on. So they need to worry about it. that's a massive risk, especially on fraud and, and all those things. So if they can look at that, I think that that, that will make it more secure uh, or at least more um, interesting as a solution. But they need to look outside just monitoring what's happening within the country. It needs to be interoperable. It needs to be obviously secure and efficient. Um, that, that will Mm, that's interesting. I was going to ask Peter this question um, specifically about the the you know the US dollar digital currency being a reserve currency, and it might sound a bit like a conspiracy theory. So forgive me, but okay. it, if it was uh, taken that the US dollar um, was was created as a, a central bank digital currency, um, and it still maintained its point as being the you know the reserve currency around the world, um, would there not then be a, a really interesting um, uh, possibility that the US could try to manipulate other countries um, economies for their local currency to fail mm. in order for them to then take out and adopt the reserve currency, which would then give them access not just to the, the economics, but also to then essential data about how the populations and things were using. Um. Uh, I told you it was going to sound a bit conspiracy theory. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's very conspiracy wise. Uh, don't worry, I won't take my tinfoil hat on now. Um, uh, I, I actually think that that um, look at the problem a little bit differently. 
uh, that is, and, and just basically to, 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 uh, to, to show the kind of problems that we have to be faced with in, in this thing here. That is, right now we have a situation where the, uh, the federal government is probably going to run out of money end of this month. Um, they have a plan B, which is uh, they have already the, uh, the platinum blanks in the treasury department and they have the, the stamp to do it. And they could basically mint a, a trillion dollar bit, uh, coin if they want to. And then they'll walk down to the Fed, give the trillion dollar uh, coin to the Fed and ask, please transfer a trillion dollar to, 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 to the, uh, to the uh, federal government's uh, bank account. Uh, and, and that's actually the kinds of risk that we are seeing with CBDCs. That is, they could actually go in and replace the funding of governments as such. So uh, instead of having all of your treasury bills and, and uh, programs, et cetera, they could just basically mint money onto the market and we will probably be somewhere uh, or in the, as in the early 70s. Uh, where we saw that. So, so, so there is a lot of structural things happening here, and that's really without going into to any of, of uh, the tinfoil uh, stories that we have there. Like, so it, it's, connect, it's a very practical thing about basically funding government. If I could just connect those two dots quickly. I mean, I think yeah. you know, it's interesting you mentioned this, the idea of the trillion dollar coin. That's actually not digital. So yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> But it would be, uh, it is exactly the same thing. Exactly, uh, it's the same thing. And yeah. the key issue is, you know, is the government a responsible steward of their currency yeah. or not? And that's the fundamental issue. Exactly. So are people going to hold another, current, another country's uh, CBDC? I mean, I remember a time not that long ago when you go to South America, people had stacks of $100 bills. It wasn't digital, but it was basically because they yeah. had more trust in the U.S. government and Treasury than they yeah. did in their local institutions. Yep. And that is the key issue in terms of are people going to hold other CBDCs is the level of trust in the government's institutions as a responsible steward of the currency. Yeah, and I guess there's, there is particular, like you say, it's kind of, you know, the conspiracy sort of thing. It's, it's those other, you know, the developing countries, those others that are a little bit more concerned yep. about what their central banks are actually intending to do with the coins. I think this is where the digital RMB could be adopted. So you look at some of the countries along the Belt and Road initiative, uh, initiative, a lot of those countries, maybe people don't have as much trust in their local currency and institutions. And so yeah. there are ways you can see, not directly, but the digital RMB could expand the interna internationalization of the RMB. I feel terrible because I've just opened up a really interesting era for debate, but we've actually run out of time. <laughs> but so it's going to be a ooh, for the next one, um, I think. Um, what I was going to do just to sort of uh, sum us all up at the end, I was basically just going to go around to each of us and maybe, um, you know, in pandemic times, it's been very difficult to predict futures and things. But maybe each of you give me a little little flavor for what you feel is going to be next for, you know, uh, digital uh, currencies, maybe in the next week, in the next month or, or maybe even in the next year. Uh, and maybe we'll start with Willie, if, if we may, and uh, to give us a little bit of your future gazing concept. Uh, thanks, Mark. How I foresee is definitely I see at least three or more countries that will go into production following China's um, uh, approach. I would also see a lot of cross-border being initiative. In fact, I, I, it's, I'm not I hardly even predicting it's already happening. You can see from Hong Kong, Singapore, there's, they're already developing like cross-border system. And you can see a lot of the central banks already participating in those separate projects. The third thing is the programmable money. This is something probably a little bit more, I would say controversial. I foresee like probably in the next three to four years, I would see CBDC with the right technology, with the right programmability aspect, we will see a more uh, ex uh, exponential growth of like probably like the open finance. We started to see probably like, I know this is controversial, probably a regulated DeFi where CBDC becomes like a payment instrument that that could also be a possibility as well. On the flip side, I saw I also see ongoing, still ongoing concerns around privacy. Definitely, we are going in different spectrum, different geography. Privacy is a key thing. Second thing as well is around as we improve, as we promote efficiency, as we promote velocity, definitely the next hot topic is around the right policies in place, how we protect like currency CBDCs that are being being thrown out, becoming like hot hot investments coming out from its jurisdictions, which probably can weaken the state as well. Yeah. 
Interesting. Okay, thank you. And maybe Peter, your your sort of uh, viewpoint on the future. Well, I think uh, first of all, it's very very difficult to to make any predictions. Uh, but uh, let me say my gut feeling, and and it's really sort of uh, what I'm seeing here. That is, we are going to literally see a race between the uh, CBDCs and the stable coins. And I think uh, David actually had the point that is that a lot of the, the gains that uh, from an efficiency point of view, uh, from a speed point of view, but also from an interoperability point of view will basically end up uh, with uh, either stable coins or CBDCs. So, and regardless of which of the two ways uh, the thing is going to be, uh, basically the banking sector, and that's, I don't care whether they call themselves a fintech or a, an established bank, uh, they will basically morph into a more a gatekeeper function, a more custodian oriented function than actually uh, balance sheet driven uh, banks. So if I, if I look at it sort of on a five to 10 year scale, I definitely see that uh, we will see a shift in and it will be major in basically the way that uh, the whole banking system, including also you could say on the one side, the insurance companies, asset management companies, et cetera, how they actually operate. Because we will be seeing far more, uh, far more a shift into to, to the gatekeeper function, into the custodian function. And then seeing on the other side, uh, the assets coming out and actually being you can even call it more sort of ETF based uh, products coming out. So, yeah. well, <clears throat> five to 10 year views is, is, a, is a very, uh, um, you know, very interesting thing to try and make assumptions on at this moment in time, but I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Oh, you could say it's, <laughs> even the ECB said that they will be there in four years. <laughs> so. Fantastic. Um, and Anthony, your, your sort of idea of uh, where the future takes us. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll probably pick it back on what Peter said. I think for me, there will be some conversation around systemic risk. So what I mean by that is, um, if you think about CBDC and e-wallets, they're directly competing against the bank deposits. Uh, and David uh, said that as well, Peter. Um, and I would that obviously affect the traditional bank. So the banks are too big to fail. So they're not gonna just go away. So what you're going to see from their point of view is there's going to be more project going towards DLT or CBDC itself, because they don't want to be left behind. And if possible, every central bank will probably use the bank as a or NFI to run that program. So it won't be directly plugged into the central bank themselves. They will use the bank to run the program so that they still remain relevant. But I think there'll be conversation around that. So what that would then lead to is when you think about, again, the idea of digital currency, why did we start with this digital currency? Is to stay away from bank, is to have the anonymity going on, all this stuff about regulation. So for me, I think there will be more conversation about regulation again, because again, regulation is not as innovative as the FinTech or the technology behind it. So there will be a way to centralize what you can do or cannot do, and that conversation will continue and probably feeding into how quickly CBDC gets adopted or not. So, because in order for it to be adopted, the FI or the banks need to be instrumental in getting out there. And I think regulation have to be either relaxed or some form of changes, which is currently around cryptocurrencies, right? And I think the last thing that I think might potentially again affect whether this get adopted quickly or not, is around security again. So is my, is it, is it can it be act? I don't know, am I see this as a guarantee? If I lose my phone, and I don't have my accounts login, what happens to my value, right? Because it's a store of value, it's real money. Uh, on a bank, I can go on ATM and take, take my cash out. So there has to be a level of education goes in about security and all those things that I think will either improve the adoption quickly or it will make people scared and don't want to do it. So I think all those conversations will probably affect the adoption over the next two years. And the more clever they are, the more, the more people understand it better. And the more you can get maybe people that normally don't want to go with the centralized solution, uh, but into it, the quicker uh, the progress we will see. So, yeah. 
Yeah, that's, I think that's interesting. And, and the point about technology really doesn't have any any limits or any borders, and it can develop itself very, very quickly. We always find that the the boundaries are the people, the governments, and, and everything else. But yeah, it's a good point. And and finally, David, your sort of uh, idea of the future. Yeah. So uh, in terms of the one year horizon you suggested, I think, frankly, we won't see a lot actually happen other than I think the DCP in China rollout will accelerate significantly from a domestic point of view. I think emerging markets where they've got much more of a retail focus for financial inclusion, I mean, reaching the unbanked, managing corruption, we'll probably see some progress there. Uh, but I think the right time frame is more, as Peter suggested, really to look over a five years plus. And I think, you know, my view would be, you know, we're going to see, you know, in the last year, central banks around the world have significantly increased their investment in research and planning and piloting. And we're going to see that continue, but it is going to take them time. Central banks do not move quickly. And for a fundamental shift like this, there's a lot of legal, fundamental legal challenges as some of the European countries have already found in terms of does the constitution allow this sort of technical capability? So it's gonna be a slow process relatively. And I think stable coins will play a transitional role uh, in this interim period where they, they can deliver a lot of benefits uh, still within the regulatory framework. So they will be acceptable and you know, they will need to tighten up their you know, uh, regulation and controls but I think they're going to be an interesting area to watch over the next three to four years. And then we will see the CBDCs kind of build momentum and start to roll out. The other th prediction I would make is that I think when it comes to the cross-border interchange between CBDCs, that actually we will see the private market develop the solutions for that. I think the political challenges between governments, governments, central banks, central bank, trying to bring all of those together uh, into a, a you know, consortium that can agree and operate together, or even regional blocks is very, very challenging. And I think you look at how the world economy works today, it is the private market that provides that interoperability between currencies. And I think we will see that. So I think there's a, that's a really interesting space from a you know, financial services point of view is who are the players who are gonna merge with the new solutions for interoperability of CBDCs? I think that is a really, really interesting point. Very interesting point because, as you said, you know, um, show me. A, a, there's not many governments themselves that can all agree with themselves what they want to do in their domestic market, let alone agree with another com country's uh, government on what they want to do. <laughs> Absolutely. So, David, just on your point, on the last point, I totally agree with you on it has to be private market because, for example, in terms of virtual, that's what we're doing for fiat. Mm -hmm. So, when when everyone take on on whether stable coin for us, it's just another currency. And if you can connect different countries together so quickly, easily, then yeah, that, that will be the easiest solution they want. At some point, maybe centralized government will come in, but it will be private to start with, yeah. Yeah, it's really worthwhile points. Well, thank you all so much for the time. I'm really disappointed we didn't have another couple of hours that we could have gone through some really other interesting uh, sort of ideas and, and conferences. But thank you all very much for your time. It's very much appreciated.